Hello and welcome to the Bath Studio School's coverage of the general election 2017. My name is Morgan Max. And I'm Alex Sutherland. Today we have Joe Raymond, who is the Labour candidate for Bath. Hello Joe, nice to, uh, nice to see you come along. Thanks for inviting me. Um, because, of course, we are at school, we're, we're young people, we're going to start with some education questions. Yep. Um, so, diving in at the deep end, why not? Um, there have been many reports that say education funding for schools is in crisis. What's your view on this? I think that's absolutely right. You know, what we're seeing is per pupil schools funding uh, falling. Um, the, the Conservatives and the Liberal Democrats uh, will both say that they will protect schools funding in cash terms. But that doesn't take into account the fact that bills are rising, uh, obviously t wages for teachers need to go up for them to be able to, to afford things, uh, and that means that the amount of money that can be spent on education is falling. We can, we've seen the Conservative plans for the next five years would see funding at this school per pupil fall by over £500 a year, uh, for the Liberal Democrats fall by over £100 a year, uh, and Labour's plans would put per pupil funding up in real terms over the next five years. So that would mean an extra teacher in the Bath Studio School. Uh, under the Conservative plans, it would mean one fewer teacher. And across Bath, we see the same thing repeated in, in nearly every school, uh, culminating in, in the fact that under the Conservatives, we'd have 75 fewer teachers in the city. Uh, under the Liberal Democrats, 26 fewer teachers. And under Labour, 52 more teachers. I think that's really important because you know, if, we, if we neglect education, that's, that's going to have knock-on effects down the line. You know, if, you, if you cut education funding, as, as John Bird, the, the founder of um, The Big Issue, said, you just have to put money into prisons, into healthcare, uh, into homelessness services, because that's what it ends up with if you don't educate people properly. If you, if you neglect education, you're not going to save money, you're just going to spend it elsewhere. And I'd rather it was spent on education than on prisons. You know, that's just a, a fundamental belief. Yeah, right. absolutely. Um, Again, with young people, many children and young people have mental health issues, uh, and if the number is rising as the years go on, and the, the queues and the waiting lists to get see professionals here with um, you know, uh, companies like CAMS and Off the Record is, is actually uh, you know, really high. My, I myself uh, has, been, has been waiting on a waiting list for about six to seven months just to see a counsellor for my first uh, session and it's it's really shown that the kids these days are not getting the support they need and I was just wondering what uh, is the Labour Party you know, planning to do about that yeah problem? that that waiting time is is absolutely unacceptable We're, since 2010 people have started talking more about mental health I think and you, you see people repeating the line we must have parity with physical health. Mental health and physical health must have parity. And you repeat it over and over again, but what have we seen in reality? It's 6,000 fewer specialist mental health nurses in this country. And, and that's why we've seen waiting lists not go down, but go up for, for mental health uh, services, uh, especially for young people. You know, Labour's plans are, are to increase health funding across the board, you know, with our, and, and fully costed, uh, our extra spending on the NHS, um, and to make sure that we ring fence that money for mental health and increase the proportion of it that's spent on children and young people's mental health funding. Because if we if we sort out mental health services for children and young people, uh, then we have to spend less on interventions for for, for major mental health crises in the future. Uh, you know, it's just like with any anything, any any health issue. If you spend it early. Uh, on, on prevention and on early intervention, then you, you spend less on, on, on expensive interventions down the line when, when, it's, when it's got too late. I think a lot of people have also got, um, you know, they're, they're worried about where the funding for that is going to come from. Uh, if you could tell us more about that, if you can. Yeah, uh, you know, I, I think that there's a, there's, what's going on in politics at the moment is, is that uh, people are expected to, to reel off numbers off the top of their heads. Mm. You know, there's some numbers that I can. Um, yeah, I can tell you that, that it's £30 billion pounds into the NHS over the next five years, and I can tell you that, uh, that our manifesto is fully costed. You know, the Conservatives' manifesto is not fully costed. They've said they don't need to fully cost it. You know, and we've offered to have our manifesto uh, looked over by the Office of Budget Responsibility um, so that they can see that it is fully costed, and, and the Conservatives have said that they wouldn't do that. Um, you know, so, and, and also there's this thing where you, uh, you're expected to, to have one policy of tax to match another policy of spend. I actually view it more as, as a whole. You know, this is all of our spending, this is all of our tax. 
you know, it's not just like this policy matches with this one. Mm. Yeah. Um, but yeah, if you look at our manifesto, you'll see fully costed. Every penny is accounted for. Well, moving on to the public sector and sticking with money, if you don't mind. Yeah. Um, uh, the Prime Minister has stated that there's no magic money tree for pay rises in the public sector. This includes, includes nurses, doctors, police, ambulance, teachers, all across the board. Um, how would your party seek to value our public sector in the future, given the wonderful job they do, demonstrated in the atrocities in London and Manchester in recent weeks, um, and, and MPs were given a pay rise above 1%? Yeah. So, so the 1% uh, pay cap is, is awful. You know, it's saying to our public sector workers that, that you know, it's okay for you to, to go home with, with less money in real terms in your pocket, because we know that, that rent, that bills, that, that food, that's gone up by more than 1% each year. Um, so, so the amount of money that, that our public, <laughs> public sector workers ha have got to spend on what they want to spend it on it, it is far less than it was uh, you know, seven years ago. Um, Theresa May says about this magical money tree, you know, and, and that is just... That uh, is just a phrase used by people who, who don't want to who don't want to make the rich pay a bit more, who who are funded by the rich. You know, their party is is massively funded by the rich, um, by by investment bankers and etc. Um, who who don't want to pay any more tax. But, you know, I think that that it's not that the money's not there, that the political will isn't there. You know, where we've got a situation where we've got thirty people every night sleeping on our streets in Bath where we've got one in five children living in poverty, uh, where we've got three food banks because people can't afford to eat, uh, where the RUH was on red alert for five weeks and where this summer teachers are gonna, head teachers are going to have to choose which teachers they're going to make redundant, you know, uh, I don't think that's, a, that's an acceptable position for our country to be in, uh, for our city to be in. Uh, and, and there is money out there. You know, there's money in, in the corporations that have had tax cuts. There's money uh, with, with the wealthiest who've had tax cuts. Uh, you know, there's money with, with the tax avoiding companies that the Tories are just unwilling to take action on. You know, there, there is money there uh, in order to pay our public sector what they deserve, especially for you know, what you said about running towards the danger in, in Manchester and in Westminster and on London Bridge. You know, people that run towards danger when everyone else runs away, those people have had their pay cut in real terms. I think that is that again is unacceptable. We cannot be a country that cuts the cuts the pay for police officers who run towards a terrorist with a knife. That's um, you mentioned the RUH, and um, of course we'll get to the NHS. Yeah. Uh, the NHS is you know in crisis. We, we all know that, and it's clear that they haven't got enough funding, not enough doctors, uh, not enough resources, and um, what. From from your point of view, what are you going to do about the um, the NHS and in turn the RUH um, <coughs> with your party? So so Labour's plans for the NHS, are, like I said, an extra thirty billion pounds over the next five years. That's what it needs, just in order to keep up with with the the changing demographic. We've got an aging population, so so actually the 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 the, uh, the pressures on the NHS are just greater every year as it is. Um, so in order to keep up with that, we need to increase NHS spending by 4% each year in real terms, you know, above inflation, just, just to kind of keep the status quo. Um, and so that's what we've committed to doing. Um, and also we need to remove privatisation from our NHS. We need to remove the private sector from the NHS. That means reversing the Health and Social Care Act, which we've seen what that's ended up with. It's ended up with Virgin running our social care services in Bath. Uh, uh, and, and the way that they won that contract was by saying, over the next seven years, our spending on social care in Bath will not go up at all. Uh, and now either, you know, either they've found that magical money tree that, uh, that Theresa May talks about, um, or what that's going to mean is in seven years' time that the social care sector in Bath will be worse off. It will mean that people, either people are getting worse care or fewer people are getting the care that they need. Uh, and that's how they've won it, and that's what privatisation privatization does to our NHS and our social care. <coughs> Absolutely. Um, the Prime Minister has said, enough is enough, and our tolerance levels for extremism must be challenged. Um, what's your view, given that the Prime Minister was Home Secretary for six years? Yeah. She cut 20,000 police 
from our streets. And that's not, that's not just about responding in the moment to, to an attack. It's about preventing terrorist attacks because uh, community police officers are the people who've got, who've got their ear to the ground, who know what's going on in the community and who can respond to things. Th again, what I was saying, with, with health, with education, with mental health, with security, it's about early intervention. Uh, you know, you cut early intervention and you're gonna have either more spending or, or people dying on our streets uh, because police have been cut. Uh, you know, the only reason that we still have a functioning police force in this country, functioning schools, functioning hospitals, is, is because the people who work in them are amazing people who, who will go above and beyond, who will work longer hours, who will work harder in order to, to stop people from, from dying, to, to make sure our children uh, are educated and, and to make sure people are safe. You know, if, if they worked the hours that they're meant to work, then, then we wouldn't have an NHS, we wouldn't have schools, uh, and we wouldn't have a police force in this country. It's only because the people who work in them are so great that, that they, they're, they're still holding up, but, but that is unsustainable. Uh, and, and we must fund our police services properly if we're going to be safe. There, there's no other way to do it. Well, Absolutely. we mentioned in that question, uh, enough is enough, which is a key phrase that the Prime Minister uh, uses. And we found that a lot of young people find those phrases a lot annoying. So, you know, Brexit means Brexit, uh, strong and stable, uh, no magic money tree is what For you For the mentioned. many, not the few. <laughs> like that, yeah. yeah. Um, and what I wanted to know, what does the Labour think of the qualities of a great Prime Minister as a leader for our nation? Yeah, so um, yeah, I, I joke about for the many, not the few, but actually, if you look at the, the Labour Party membership card, it's on the back of it. Uh, you know, it's, not, it's not just some slogan dreamt up for this election. It actually means something. It's a, it's a core idea in the Labour Party that's, you know, that, that strings through, through Jeremy Corbyn, Tony Blair, back to Clement Attlee and, and Keir Hardy. You know, it's what we've always been about. It's about you know, standing up for, for ordinary people, not, not for the... For the richest and most powerful in our society. And that's what leadership is. Leadership is not being strong in the face of the weak, you know, uh, cutting benefits and, uh, and cutting the public sector uh, and weak in the face of the strong, you know, not standing up to, to Rupert Murdoch or, or, or the banks or the energy companies. You know, that's not, that's not leadership. That's not being a strong leader. Uh, being a strong leader means, you know, having the courage to stand up to the most powerful. Uh, and, you know, I think that we've seen in, in his you know, 35 years or so in politics, that's what Jeremy Corbyn's done throughout the whole time, you know, uh, and that's what Theresa May has never done. And so, so, you know, when Theresa May talks about leadership, she can come out and she can you know, speak like you expect a leader to speak, but what does she actually do? She's, she's weak with the strong and she's strong with the weak. Not leadership in my book. Uh, personally, I agree with you. It's, uh, um, you know, it's a, it's it's a tough one when you're, um, you know, just trying to look out for uh, the little guy. Um, but uh, it's not always the case. It's um, so, for example, in with the going back to young people in Bath, um, it's increasingly hard for young people to get on the property ladder. Rents are really high. Zero-hour contracts are the norm now. Security is weak, uh, job security is weak. They were saddled with enormous graduate debts, Brexit uncertainty, benefit cuts, the list goes on and on. Um, but do politicians really care about young people in Bath? Uh, I, I can say that I do. You know, I've, I've been consistent in my championing of young people in this city as a councillor for the last two years. Um, talking about the fact that one in five children lives in poverty, that rises to one in three in Twerton that I represent on the council. You know, standing up for students at the university. You know, I've been a uh, leading voice in, in the campaigns for uh, ag against further rises in tuition fees that we've seen happening now, uh, for for a living wage for all student staff at the university, uh, and, and against the pay inequality that we've seen there. You know, with the with the vice chancellor being paid over four hundred and fifty thousand pounds a year, uh, and some people not even being paid enough to live on, uh, and, and on housing. We, we can see that the cheapest place to rent in Bath on your own is a studio flat with uh, something that was described as a kitchen type thing, not even a proper kitchen, um, a shower room, 
uh, and that's £520 a month. If you want a one-bedroom flat, the average is, is £800 a month. Uh, and for a two-bedroom flat, it's, it's £1,200 a month. You know, that's, that's an unacceptable situation for us to be in, in this city. And you know, others will talk about the fact that we're, we're, we're a wealthy city, we're, you know, uh, the land value is high, but I, just, I don't accept that as an excuse. If, if we want to bring house prices down in the city, uh, the only way to do it, the only ways to do it are, are through a massive house building program. So, so Labour's plan is for for a million new homes by 2022, uh, about half of which will be social housing, uh, and for rent controls because landlords have been getting away with putting rents up by far more than inflation, far more than people's wages are going up, and that means the proportion of your of your of your salary that you're spending on rent has just been rising and rising and rising. And now, it's over, for for a lot of people, it's over half of all their money goes on just their rent. You know, if if we put a cap on annual rent rises so they couldn't go up by more than inflation, then that will hopefully stem this tide of, of people just spending more and more and more of what they take home on, on just having a place to live. Um, a couple more questions from me personally. Um, it, you said in your, uh, you've stated, as well as Jeremy Corbyn, I mean, the, the Labour Party have stated that um, they will reduce the, the uh, voting age to 16. And now I think, I personally think that's a great thing. But um, I think some people have worries that maybe 16-year-olds are not well educated in politics. And I was wondering if maybe the Labour Party in education will perhaps, you know, bring something in to, if they're going to lower the age, then you might as well educate them. Yeah. If, is that something that's ever gone through your mind? Yeah, well, I, I support votes at 16. I always have because I don't believe in taxation without representation. You know, it's, it's something that goes back, you know, you saw it in the, uh, in the American War of Independence and, and you know, I think 16 year olds should, uh, should be perhaps not taking up arms, but you know, at least going on a demo for, for, for votes at 16. You, know, you can pay tax, you can work, you can pay tax, and, uh, and you should be able to vote. And we've seen in, in Scotland what that's done. You know, in, in the independence referendum, we saw 16 and 17 year olds going out uh, and, and having a massive turnout in, in that referendum. Um, and we've seen that hold up now. You know, I think that, that votes at 16 will, will not just, it's not just fair, but it's good for, for our democracy, it's good for, for turnout among young people. Um, I think political education in schools is important. Um, I think there's a lot of people who don't know how our political system works. There's a lot of people, you know, I go out and I talk to people and they say, yeah, I'm voting for Theresa May. Well, you're not, because Theresa May is not on the ballot paper in Bath. Um, and people don't understand how our parliamentary democracy works, uh, and there's, you know, there's a lot of things that, that are quite um, archaic and, uh, and confusing about our democracy. Um, uh, but I also support electoral reform more, more generally because I want, I want people's votes to, to everyone's votes to matter. Um, you know, I think that uh, it, it's, it's absolutely unfair that we have a system where someone can, can get 30 or so percent of the vote, but then govern like they got over 50 percent of it. That's just not fair, and that's not how it should happen. Well, um, we still have a bit of time, so we could take some audience questions yeah, if you like. Absolutely. So are you ready for the audience questions? All right, we've got anything. I don't want to do audience. Wants to ask a couple of questions. Paris, you've got your question. Um, sure. Um, I was just wondering. You spoke about university fees. Could you go? into more depth about that, because obviously like, that's part of our future. Yeah, sorry, what was your name? Paris. Paris, thanks. Um, so Labour's policy is obviously for, uh, for free university tuition, because we don't believe that, that university is a commodity to be bought and sold. It's something that should be passed from generation to generation. And so not only is that good for, for students, uh, obviously, but it's also, it's broader than that. It's about the way that the higher education sector in our country works. Because should universities be competing against each other uh, for students? I don't think so. I don't think universities should be competitors with each other. And I worked in, in a university until recently. I worked in student funding. Uh, and we use the terms competitors for other universities and, and customers for students. I don't think that's how our education system should work. You know, I think universities should be partners with each other, you know, helping each other, not, not competing with each other. And I think students should not be customers of a university. They should be students. Um, uh, and also, 
um, we, we'll, we'll bring back maintenance grants for students because uh, for low-income students because the fact is that at the moment since since maintenance grants were cut it means that students from from the poorest backgrounds end up with the most debt uh, and that's just not that's just not right all right got any others any other questions anyone else we can we have time for one more we've got time for one more <laughs> well i've got a question anyway yeah so um you were talking about university fees and everything like that yeah it's a huge part of what you're planning to spend yeah it's um you know it makes i think it's something around like a quarter it's 11 billion 11 billion yeah it's huge yeah um uh, he, is that something you're comfortable with spending that much money on abolishing university tuition fees or would it be more sensible just to lower them or no, I, no i'm completely comfortable with it because like i said it's about it's about the marketization of higher education i don't think higher education should be a marketplace um i think it's really important that, that we make university free um i don't think it ever you know i accept you know it was Labour who introduced tuition fees to start with, and it was uh, obviously the Liberal Democrats and the Conservatives who then took them up to £9,000 a year. Um, but, but yeah, I, I, I don't think we should have ever been charging for education. I, I think that's wrong. Uh, and the fact is that, that a better educated society uh, has, you know, if you want to look at it in cold terms, it, it has a net economic benefit. You know, for businesses, having better educated workers is better for them uh, and and for our, for our society in general it's it's better socially for people to be educated um and and so i think that actually in the long run we'll see that it's not it's not a huge cost to our country it, you know education is is an economic benefit uh, and i don't think that we should shy away from from saying that and, and shy away from from the idea that people should not be paying and getting into tens of thousands of pounds of debt just to get an education. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for coming Thanks. in. Thanks, sir. Uh, it's been very a pleasure. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for that. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much. That's all we've got time for now. So thank you very much for watching, and goodbye from the Bath Studio School.